wonderful to see everyone here this morning. Especially like to welcome our visitors. I have several uh, announcements I wanted to touch on. Uh, the first one is, of course, we're going to be having a picnic at McIntyre Park. Um, it is the same park if, if, you know, when the slide comes up, up here, I did misspell it. So uh, if you punch in that to look it up uh, where it's at, you'll be looking for the wrong place. But uh, most of you know where it is, just down the road. Uh, we're going to have a picnic there in two weeks. So uh, please keep that in mind. So it's going to be on Sunday, and we're going to go down after services on Sunday. Uh, be down there, and I think they had the park pretty much for the rest of the day. Uh, so pre please bring any ball equipment you have, anything you want to play with down there. Um, bring your chairs. So if you remember last time, we had all our chairs set up. Uh, food will be provided. So we'll have subs from Jersey Mike's with chips, cookies, and watermelon. So uh, please mark that down in two weeks. Uh, look forward to having a great time out there, and hopefully the weather will cooperate for us. I have a note that Ann Herndon is expected to go home on Tuesday or Wednesday, so that's good news. Uh, Jim Brown, please keep him in your prayers. He's had a, a CT scan, and if you've talked to him recently, he's aware that uh, he's uh, going to be potentially having to have an aortic valve replacement. So he's going in to see the doctor this week to talk to them about that and potentially schedule it. Uh, so we'll have more follow on as he has that meeting. I did get a note from Janet this morning. Um, if you're aware, Melissa's parents uh, were coming down to visit. Of course, they recently had the baby. Her dad, Keith, however, just tested positive for COVID. They will probably drive back to Ohio before uh, her mom, Sharon, shows symptoms. Uh, the rest of them are going to isolate from each other and pray that we don't hit, hit it with uh, one another with the virus. And uh, please pray for the baby. Um, so as Janet uh, ended her text, she said, I caramba. So that was, uh, you know, lots of things going on, a new baby in the house. And then, uh, of course, the grandparents come down to visit and uh, have to go back, which is sad as well, because I'm sure they wanted to spend lots of time with the baby. So please keep all of them in your prayers. There will be a lock-in at Waynesboro on the 26th through the 27th. So that goes over Friday night. Uh, if you are interested in that, uh, please let me know. I assume it will primarily be the youth. Um, if you're not the youth and you want to come, let me know too. Uh, if you want to stay up all night and uh, play games. Um, but it goes from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. on Friday, uh, the 26th of August. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have a suggestion box in the back of the, the foyer. So if you ha ever have any suggestions, uh, please put those in there. And of course, we take prayer requests in the box in the back as well. So let us go to God in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the many blessings you give us. We thank you for this family that we have here that comes together to worship you, Lord. Pray that you be with us, Father, and help us to have the right heart and mind as we come to you and worship, that we be an example to those around us each and every day, Father. We ask that you be with those that were lifted up today that need our prayers. Help us to remember to pray for them and to keep them on our hearts, Lord. And we pray that you be with them and keep your hand on them as they are healing or concerned about COVID, Father. We pray that you be with them. Lord, we thank you for your son that came to this earth and died on that cross for us. And in Jesus' name, amen. morning. Before the communion, we'll sing number 325 in memory of the Savior's love, all three verses. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast, where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup in token of his blood the 
blood was for sinners shed. Beneath his banner thus we sing the wonders of his love. And here anticipate by faith the heavenly feast above. As we come together on this first day of the week to remember our Lord's sacrifice and suffering, as we prepare our hearts and minds, I'd like to read something from 1 John 4th chapter, verses 17 through 21. Again, 1 John 4th chapter, 17 through 21. For it is better if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for our sins once for all for the just, for the unjust, in order that he must bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient when he had patience, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not for the removal of dirt from flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just found that that captured everything in just five verses. And so now let us, before we take the bread, say a prayer. Dear Father, we are so very thankful for all our many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We're most thankful for the fact you sent your Son to earth to suffer and die for the just and the unjust, for all of us. That you allowed him to come and be our living sacrifice, be that bread that feeds us so that we may never be hungry. Lord, help us take this in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And in your son's most holy name we pray. Amen. Now let us continue in prayer for the cup. Most gracious Father, you are so merciful. You've given us that grace that we do not deserve. Help us grow stronger in our faith, Father. This morning, as we take this cup, we're reminded of the blood that was shed on our behalf once and for all, for all men. Help us take this cup also in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And in your son's most holy name we pray, amen. talked to Tim and I heard that he was thinking of preaching from Job, I joked, well, I don't think we have any Job songs in the hymn. But actually, the title of this song comes straight from the mouth of Job. In Job chapter 19, verse 25, when he's yet again defending himself 
before his friends. He testifies about his faith and his hope for the future, regardless of what happens to him, regardless of how much he suffered. He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold. We'll sing the uh, first and last verses here. I know that my Redeemer lives and living cares for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Yeah, I do like that excitement. Larry, you know, I was a youth minister for about 30 years, and I have done lock-ins. However, I, I really didn't do very many in those 30 years, but I have certainly uh, reached my quota, my, my limit. So don't be looking for me in a couple of weeks in Waynesboro. But if you haven't reached your limit, then go right ahead. Start with a story that happened in 2017. Uh, Denise and I bought a house. We were in a temporary rental situation, and this house just kind of fell out of the sky. It was perfect for us. Um, we were able to, to buy it at a good price. And during the inspection, everything was looking pretty good, and the um, the inspector had gone outside to look at the AC unit, and when he came back in, I, I, could, I could tell he had some kind of puzzled look on his face, and I said, after looking at the AC, is everything okay, because that could be expensive. He said, yes, everything's running, but I've never seen a unit that old still running. See, the house was built in 1952, and this was 2017, and it was the original unit. So we're, we're like 65 years into the life of this thing, and, and part of that's amazing. When something that old continues to function, you know, it's kind of like getting out of bed in the morning, you're still working, that's good. But just being old doesn't uh, make it good, because there were... There were issues. A unit built in 1952 was no longer as efficient in its use of electricity as newer units. And sad to say, that it didn't make it to its 70th birthday. It died before then, and there's now a new unit in that house. We replaced it. That's kind of the context I want us to look at Job this morning. Job's an old story. That's a theme of our, our lessons here, our old stories. 
However, sometimes we need to update, we need to replace, we need to look at how we're thinking about the world around us. And so I think Job's going to help us do that. Job helps us in our struggle on how to evaluate life. And there are some long-held, even all the way back to the time of Job, long-held thinking that is not necessarily, well, I'll say it stronger, is not helpful. So you know the basics of Job, right? Blameless, upright, feared God, shunned evil, big family, lots of stuff, lots of servants. And it said about him, he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So we kind of go, good guy, right? But then life changes. He has no servants. He has no stuff. He has no kids. And here's his response, chapter 1, verse 20. Then Job got up and tore his robe. He shaved his head. Then he threw himself down with his face to the ground. That's pretty upset, if you ask me. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. In all this, Job did not sin, nor did he charge God with moral impropriety. He didn't blame God. He didn't sin in his thinking. But it's But it gets worse, right? Now, it's no health. It's it's attacked his body. And so he's personally suffering. Today I want to define suffering this way. Whenever you're not in control. That's when we suffer. Because if we can control it, we can fix it then we feel more secure. When we measure circumstances simply by are they good or bad, that can be a problem because we can't control either of those. It's difficult if we measure things that way to see suffering as good. Who would ever sign up for that? Who would want that? But we need to see what is greater than our suffering. That's one thing that suffering produces. And you know, in chapter 2, his wife has had enough. Then his wife said to him, in verse 9, Are you still holding firmly to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he replied, You're talking like one of the godless women would do. Should we receive what is good from God... And not also receive what is evil. And all this Job did not sin by what he said. I have more bad news. Sorry. Because it gets worse. How can it get worse? Well, his friends show up. You know things are (laughs) struggling when your friends show up and they don't help, right? Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, his three friends, they came from a ways away and they arrive and they see Job in the state that he is and for seven days, they don't say a word, they're silent. One is because they don't have words because what's happening to Job flies in the face of how they think life should work. And they certainly have no words of comfort. And so they grieve and mourn him like one who is dead. Right? Their reaction is more appropriate for a death. Not somebody who has suffered tragedy. And Job is feeling the pressure of this in chapter 3. Remember what Job does? He curses the day of his birth. He's thinking, I don't deserve what happened to me. And then he gets in a long argument with his friends. Because his friends in the world in that day and still today live by a code. If you're good, 
good things happen. And if you're bad, bad things happen. And that certainly can be true some of the time, but it's not universally true. It's not as if life is some kind of transaction and you're putting in the bank, staying in control. If you just be good enough, then only good is going to happen. See, that's, that's not helpful thinking. Because sometimes good things happen to people who do evil. And sometimes good things, excuse me, sometimes bad things happen to people who live righteous. It's, it's not a satisfactory way to look at life. And most of the next 15, 16 chapters is about Job and his friends arguing. They're thinking, Job, we thought you were good, but we were mistaken. Look what happened to you. Why don't you just tell us what's underneath the surface, why, what, what you're really all about. And Job pushes back on that. He's thinking, God has wronged me. And he wants a chance to prove it. If I could just get God alone and sit down and talk to him, we could get this straightened out because he must have forgot how things work. And it's an idea that we still live by today. We judge good and bad on all circumstances, but most of the time we don't have a full context to see. Sometimes things that we called bad later, we look back and go, you know, it was a good thing that happened. Or sometimes we think, well, th this is a great thing, I want to do this, and then we look back later and say, you know, that wasn't really helpful at all. But as these conversations, as they go back and forth, arguing about the nature of life and how it's supposed to work, Job, in his spirit, begins to feel unjustly picked on. Look at chapter 19. Here's Job's answer to his friend's Chapter 18 was uh, Bildad that was doing most of the talking, but they're all saying these things. And here's his response. How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Again, those friends aren't being very helpful. These ten times you have been reproaching me, you are not ashamed to attack me. Even with all he had lost, now he feels attacked by his friends. And he says, but even if it were true, and that I have erred. So he's not even willing to admit that yet. My error remains solely my concern. If indeed you would exalt yourselves above me and plead my disgrace against me, Know that God has wronged me and encircled me with his net. He's pushing back on his friends. This is not your problem. This is between me and God. And if I erred, and I re you can hear it in parentheses, right? I don't really think I have. You would be wrong. And he is correct in this. That you now feel superior to me. That you think you are above me. See, we are attracted to the idea that we could earn our way, right? That we don't need any help from anybody. We can make it on our own. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We take that saying today and say, yeah, I want to do that, but do you realize when they first started saying that it was an absurdity? Have you ever reached down and, and, and tried to jump over something by pulling up your boots? You're, you're not going to succeed, but it doesn't stop us from trying. And you get it, right? What's at the bottom of that? 
It's if I can act this way and get this outcome, it's something I'm deserving and I'm in control. We don't have to have stress. We don't have to have struggle because we're in control of everything. I don't know what your experience of life is, but mine is certainly not feeling like I'm always in control. So now Job feels totally deserted by God and his friends. Yet in the midst of this despair, a new hope begins to emerge and a stronger faith. The thing that our struggle should produce. And even though he knows he will die in his innocence, he also knows at that time, at the end, that God will vindicate him. I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. You heard the further words that Clark read a while ago, but the idea is at the end God's going to stand for me. And that is true. And that is a great thing. He's, he's laying into this idea of the ancient Jewish idea of a kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer was there when there was an issue in the family to come and stand, to redeem, to protect, to vindicate, to pay off one's debts, to defend the family, to avenge a killing, to even marrying the widow of a deceased kinsman so that she could be provided for. So in his thinking, Job is making progress. But he still has further to go. We're only in the chapter 19. There's 42 chapters. So let's continue with him. They continue in arguing for a while, but in verse 32, things changed. Ch excuse me, chapter 32, things changed. We have a new character show up. The four we've been talking about, Job and his three friends, are frustrated with each other because they're not getting anywhere. Chapter 32 says, So these men refused to answer Job further because he was righteous in his own eyes. They say, you're bad, and he says, no, I'm not, and I can prove it. Verse 2, then Elihu became very angry. He was angry with Job. This is the new guy, Elihu. For justifying himself rather than God. We're good at that, right? We look at the other and say they were wrong for doing that. And we might do the same thing. And we can explain why we were justified in acting that way. Verse 3 says he's with Job's three friends. He was also angry. Because they could not find an answer. And so declared Job guilty. See, they were still living just by the simplistic rule. Bad things happen to you, Job, so you have to be bad. We don't have any other explanation. We're not willing to look at anything else. Now, Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because the others were older than he was. Sign of respect. But when Elihu saw that the three men had no further reply, he became angry. He is angry with Job and the three others because they're locked in to this way of thinking. Do good, get blessed. Do evil, suffer. I do think we should make good choices. But it's no guarantee things will turn out the way we think we deserve. Because things are beyond our control. And Elihu has two problems with Job. First, Job is not innocent. We're aware of that, right? We, you probably already quickly in your mind go to Romans and think, for all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Indeed, that is an awareness that is good to live by. And so 
Job cannot have earned in the sense of I am owed payment of his blessing, his payment for doing good, as much good as he had done. But Elihu has a bigger problem. He does not agree with Job's view of God. Look at chapter, in chapter 33, some of, you can read that chapter, and here are some of the ways that Elihu describes God as someone who gives revelation, that's understanding, teaching, someone who spares others, someone who draws near, someone who is a, a mediator, someone who ransoms and someone who redeems. Look at chapter 33, verse 28. He redeemed my life from going down to the place of corruption, and my life sees the light. The youngest of the four has the best understanding of what God is doing in his life. And Job's not quite there yet. Job's answer to this gridlock is to take God to court. He wants God to answer him. And guess what? God does. God is willing to take our thinking, our struggle, our way of looking at life and allows us to wrestle with him. And in verse 38, excuse me, chapter 38, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Some versions say storm. This chaos, this struggle, this, this suffering, out of the midst of that, God speaks. And he asks a question. Who is this who darkens counsel with words without knowledge. Job, are you sure you know what you're talking about? Get ready for a difficult task like a man. I will question you and you will inform me. God says, okay. You want to talk? Let's talk. Let me ask some questions. In the next couple of chapters, it's God asking question after question. A lot of them were, where were you when this happened? See, Job has made a fundamental error in his thinking. He viewed himself as equal with God. That his behavior could force his outcomes, the ones that he wanted, the one he desired. But what he's forgotten about God is that God is larger, greater, more, better able to see. And so we get to chapter 40 the Lord answered Job will the one who contends with the almighty correct him let the person who accuses God give him an answer but through this struggle with God look what's happening Look how Job is being transformed in his thinking. Verse 4, Job says, Indeed, I am completely unworthy. How could I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth to silence myself. How many times do, have you had that thought, not necessarily just with God, but with another conversation where you wish you had done that like five seconds before, if you had just held your tongue or not said what just popped into your brain? I put my hand over my mouth to silence myself. I have spoken once, but I cannot answer twice, but I will say no more. See, his eyes are being opened up. He's starting to see things differently. He says, I think I will shut up now. Indeed, I do not understand everything. I am not the equal of God. There is plenty that I am yet to understand. 
Look at his conclusion in chapter 42. Here's what he comes to, to see. And the emphasis will be on what he comes to experience in that seeing. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this who darkens counsel without knowledge? But I have declared without understanding things too wonderful for me to know. You said, pay attention and I will speak. I will question you and you will answer me. Now hear this, if you're not hearing anything else, hear verse 5. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye has seen you. See, there's a difference in hearing about God and contending with God, pushing him for answers. That allows us to come to see him as we've never seen him before. In verse 6, Job's response, Therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. See, the issue was never, is Job perfect enough that he doesn't deserve not controlling everything in his life? And he begins to see that. So let's not miss what God is doing. Even in the midst of struggle, of Job's struggle. And hopefully we can bring that to our struggle. When things are beyond our control, what is the appropriate response? We rest on him. We deepen our dependence on him. It's one thing to see God as a redeemer at the end of time. But it's a far greater thing to see him as redeemer now. Job can now see, not just at the last time, but in the present, redemption. And don't miss the trans transformation that accompanies that seeing. In good things, God will work. And in things we even label bad, God will work. And we have a better understanding because we have a greater picture of who God is. Because not only do we have a relationship with the Father, but we have a relationship with His Son. And not just relationship, but we become part of the family. When Paul, in Acts chapter 17, were dressing some of the scholars in Athens, here's the picture that he paints. Acts 17, verse 26. From one man, he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth, determining their set times and the fixed limits of the places where they would live for this purpose. Verse 27. So that they would search for God, perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. What, is, what does our struggle do? It causes us to look up. It causes us to look around. It causes us to say, this is beyond me. Verse 28. For in him we live and move about and exist. And even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. We find life in God, not in the ease of our existence. We find life because he is near, 
And he is even nearer in times that we have no control in our suffering. And we find life in a Redeemer who sees us through all things, who is with us, even now. If we think his love will prevent our struggle, we're wrong. But we can be sure that his love will sustain us. And our response determines whether we experience suffering or we see it as developing a deeper love with our Father. We're not trying to prevent bad from happening. We're trying to experience the redemption that can only come from God. Our goal is not prevention because so many things are beyond our control. Clark is going to come lead a closing song in just a moment. Hear it as an invitation. Even if you're in the midst of struggle, maybe even more if you're in the midst of struggle. Because this struggle is our call. It is our plea to Jesus. The song has been recorded in a couple of places, but one is on a collection of lullabies. Words that you would sing over a child as they go to sleep. In fact, the name of that specific album is Sleep Sound in Jesus. That's, that's the picture I want us to take away from Job today. No matter what's going on around you. We're like that small child that can sleep through anything. Not because of ourselves. But because of Jesus. So hear these words and then let's sing them together. Jesus, let us come to know you. Let us see you face to face. Touch us. Hold us. Use us. Mold us. Only let us live in you. Jesus, draw us ever nearer. Hold us in your loving arms. Wrap us in your gentle presence. And when the end comes, bring us home. Clark, come and lead us. Number 947. Jesus, let us come to know you. Let us see you face to face. Touch us, hold us, use us. Dear Lord, as we go forth with this week, 
May people see in us you shining in the works that we do and the spirit which we present to others. May we always take the time to look at the gifts that you've bestowed upon us and use them to further your word and further your reach in this community. Guide, guard, and correct us, Lord. Give us strength and give us courage. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.